So, our next speaker is Professor Jerry McCormack. So, Jerry's background is um, he started uh, uh, undertaking research in both space physics and carbon dating. He worked previously for NASA Dynamics Explorer Satellite Program at the University of um, Michigan before com becoming the director of carbon dating at the, uh, Queen's University Belfast and became a pro in 2001 at the University of Belf Queen's University of Belfast. Then he moved to Stirling, where he became the principal and vice chancellor, where he led the transformation of the student experience, earning the reputation of the university globally, and extend the university rich relevance and connectivity. Today, I am really pleased to welcome Professor Jerry Markermuck on the podium, who is going to talk about the contextualization and the university strategy and where they go in. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Natalie, Sally, and, um, and my old colleague and friend, Paddy Daly, from uh, Queens and Belfast. We worked there for many years. And I should explain at the outset that um, way back, I think it was about nine months ago, um, Paddy uh, contacted my office and said, there's a USISA conference in Glasgow, would you mind coming along and doing the welcoming speech? Um, I said, that's absolutely fine. At that time, I didn't know that David Telford would be moving to the University of Stirling as the Director of Information Services, but that is what's going to happen. I also didn't know at that time, um, because it was scheduled for September, that I would have to dash off immediately after this uh, to Madrid. I also did not know that there was no direct flight from Glasgow or Edinburgh <laughs> to, to Madrid. And so I have to go via Amsterdam and I have a long, long journey ahead of me and I arrive in Madrid tonight. So you will forgive me because what I'm gonna do is say a little bit about the University of Stirling, about strategy and the importance of strategy as the foundations for change in our institutions, which is the title of the talk. I'm um, then going to pass over to uh, David, who fortuitously now, or, or as of, it says Napier on the slide, but as of Monday, it'll be the University of Stirling, but fortuitously, it's going to pick up the baton, um, allow me to, to dash off and catch this plane and carry on the session. And I think one of the benefits of that is that there's an opportunity then um, to try a different style of welcome. Anyway, listening to me for an hour about university strategy is probably not what you really want to do. So I have about seven or eight slides and hopefully you'll find something um, useful um, within that. Um, uh, one of the best vice chancellors I ever worked with was at Queen's. In fact, he appointed me as pro-vice chancellor. His name was George Bain. I don't know if any, some of you in the room will know who George was. And he had many sayings, he had a military background, and one of his sayings was that um, the 34th President of the United States, Dwight Eisenhower, used to say that even the best strategies only, in, uh, only survive the first encounter with the enemy. And certainly in terms of the strategy that we put in place in Sterling, and I think if I press this button, the slides move on. We're appointed. No. Yep, there we go. This is the University of Stirling, the Wallace Monument, for those who are familiar with uh, Scotland and part of the administration building and the beautiful lock that we have. Um, but when we put in place our st university strategy from 2016 to 2021, um, Theresa May was Home Secretary. There was no Brexit and nobody thought that there would be. Donald Trump wasn't President of the United States and the world was in a very different place from where it is um, today. That said, if your strategic plan is, is appropriate, if it's ambitious, if you have um, a clear vision of what you want to achieve, and most importantly, if you get buy-in from um, staff across the organization, and I think the way we did, the way we created the strategic plan allowed us to do that, then you still have a chance of success. You have to flex, flex your tactics, do things differently because of the barriers that emerge and appear but hopefully we'll be able to deliver it. I, I tell our, our court and the chair of court that um, I did warn you that all of these traffic lights could be red at the end of this, and that was before I knew about Brexit and Trump and all the other things that, that have come along um, since. Um, a little bit more about um, 
I'm not sure where I should point this to. There we go. Oh, I want to go back one. There we go. Okay, so um, just a little bit about the history of the university. It was founded in 1967 by Royal Charter, it made us 50 years old last year. Happily, we were one of the top 50 in the world under the age of 50. Now we're 51. We've fallen out of that and, and can't claim that anymore. But apparently, they're now golden age universities, and they last up to 75. So we have a bit to go there. These are some of the accolades. I'll not read <laughs> through them. Um, but we needed some way in which to um, have a high level of recall and understanding across all levels of the university. And we used um, a mnemonic. That was 25, 50, 100. And that stood for we wanted to move from where we are, about 45th in the UK in terms of league tables, to about up in the top 25. And we looked at the metrics and thought that was possible. We wanted to increase our income for by 50 million pounds, and we needed to double the intensity of, of our research overall. None of those metrics were important um, in themselves. They were a shorthand for a whole range of activities that underpinned the, the strategic plan. Um, and we've made some progress, um, some progress towards that, despite the, the difficulties um, that, that we faced. Um, but in terms of setting foundations and, and, and having that strategic approach, often what happens, and certainly in other institutions I've worked in, there have been corporate plans, there have been strategic plans, they go through a whole exercise, they're printed in glossy brochures, and then they're stuck in the top drawer and everybody gets on with what um, they normally do, and that was it. that's typical. What we tried to do at Sterling, and with some effect, is say, no, we'll test any plans that come forward, whether it's for infrastructure, capital development, whether it's courses we're doing, internationalization. We'll test those against the objectives of the strategic plan and see, are they delivering against that? I see some of my colleagues nodding and saying, yeah, that's exactly what you do do, and we do do that. And, and, and that's really powerful, that it's a real document. And what it means is that we're, when we next create another strategic plan, there's a real shared understanding that this is something not just that gets filed in the top drawer, but everybody should contribute to it. And the goal then will be um, that ultimately um, it, 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 it delivers for the organization. Um, some of our recent successes, I am getting to the bad news, by the way, at one point here, but some of our recent successes um, have been around the city deal. We've just had um, 47 um, million pounds or so allocated. We need to, uh, well, there's a lot of hoops to jump through before we see the checks in the bank. Um, but those will um, create a new institute of aquaculture and many of you will know that Sterling's famous for aquaculture and food science. They're a new environmental center and we're creating a thing called an intergenerational village where young people and elderly people and aged people will live and work together and look at the technological interventions, engineering, these smart Apple watches, how can you prevent visits to hospital, how can you um, deal with people in their homes rather than having to deal with them elsewhere, how can you make the homes smart and intelligent, so we have a research um, program around that. Out of our own in, uh, money and money that we've borrowed from the bank and so on uh, through a private placement, uh, we're creating a new sports centre and you'll know, I hope, that we're quite famous for sport in Stirling as well. Um, we had uh, Duncan Scott, who um, in the Commonwealth Games uh, beat the Olympic gold medalist um, in the 100 metre freestyle. We have Ross Murdoch in the breaststroke. We have a brilliant golf team. Anyway, but we had rubbish um, sports facilities because they were 50 years old and needed updated. So we're, we're building and, and renewing those as we speak. Um, we also are recognizing going forward what students need for the future, and that is, so we've created a thing called Campus Central with social learning space and a very different way of doing things, triaging students in, the, in this atrium space rather than having, you know, offices to go to and, and so on. So a lot of the stuff that you'll probably be talking about, that um, how technology interacts for, the better, um, for a better student experience then are the sorts of things we're trying to build and integrate into all of the, um, the new developments that, that we have. Um, and content then is so important. And one of the things, even at the time of the creation of the strategic plan, um, the 
question was how do you then communicate this throughout the organization so that people are aware of what we do and so uh, uh, as is very common and I'm sure you're all doing things like this in, in different ways or in interacting with people who are it's video content it's imagery you know if you're tweeting and you put an image on it's 10 times something like that more likely to be open than it is if it's just text and video is a way is is very common means a channel of communication now so this is um, I'm going to show you now I hope because we had a wee bit of trouble with it earlier but I'm going to show you the the video that we created um, at the launch of our strategic plan um, and the sterling people aren't allowed to comment but if any of the rest of you can guess whose voice it is um, there's a prize at the end at the University of Stirling we connect people through our teaching and research, we innovate. And by thinking of new ways of doing things, we transform the lives of our students, our staff, and the global communities that we serve. Everything we do is underpinned by our core values, openness, excellence, ambition. But the needs of individuals and society don't stand still, and we have to respond to them. That's why we've identified three objectives to help us to stay focused. To be one of the top 25 universities in the UK. To increase our income by 50 million pounds. To enhance our research profile by 100%. So how will we achieve these ambitious targets? With people like you. By connecting people with the skills and passion to deliver innovative teaching and learning we are transforming the student experience and with people like you. Using our research knowledge, we're working with policymakers and leaders of industry to help to find innovative solutions to real life problems. There are also people like you. We're working in partnership with business, government and communities to transform the way that people engage with the world. And there are people like you. We're continuously developing our long-term intellectual capital and economic and environmental sustainability in all our business activity. None of this is possible without these people and none of it is possible without you. That's because you can make it happen. Any guesses as to who the, who the voice is? Oh, it's easy, isn't it? Yeah. Former Radio 4 um, uh, presenter, Today Programme presenter, still on occasionally. Um, but uh, Jim was our, uh, our cha the Chancellor of our university for the past 10 years and sadly um, stood down, uh, having completed his term this year. And we're about to announce who our, our new Chancellor will be. But one of the huge advantages of having someone like Jim is you get the voiceovers for free on these videos. So. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, it would have cost us a fortune if we'd gone to his agent and asked and asked to do it. But he did it. He did it. He did it for nothing for us. Um, so, uh, I mean, the the strategic plan, upbeat messages. We're going to try to deliver against this 255100 strategy. We're making progress towards it. Not as fast or as as um, as great as we would wish, but we're making progress towards it. And, and of course, all sorts of things have changed as in, in, in the meantime and we're living right through it now um, Brexit um, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute or two I mean is, um, is, is with us and the whole political uncertainty around that but there are a whole range of, of other things the, the divergence of higher education across the, the UK in terms of as, as a, a devolved issue causes all sorts of uh, problems um, so in Scotland, students from home in EU don't pay um, fees, whereas they do in England. Um, rest of UK students, as we refer to them in Scotland, pay the same fees that they would in England to come to a Scottish university and so on. And the interdependencies, dependencies, the mobility, the, um, the uncertainty that gets created through that can be hugely difficult to, to navigate our, our way through. Um, we're in the spotlight for all sorts of reasons. I mean, annually there's the shooting season for vice chancellors over salary and I and everybody else who does these jobs gets that. There's different governance arrangements in the 
um, in uh, the different regions of the UK. There were dealing with industrial action, there were pensions issues that are still ongoing and things like that to deal with. Then there's Philip Auger's review, uh, post-18 review and what will happen to um, funding as a, a, a consequence of, um, of that review. And of course, anything that happens in England will impact upon Wales, Northern Ireland and, uh, and Scotland. And in, in, because of the, the scale of the higher education sector in England, of course, those changes um, and it can affect us gravely, but aren't often always thought about. So part of our job in Scotland, and I'm vice convener at University of Scotland, along with David's form, former boss, Andrea Nolan, who's convener, is to continue to communicate the unintended consequences of some of the, um, the divergences that, that we have there. There's some good news also, though. I mean, there's the industrial strategy, which is um, injecting £4.7 billion of money into um, higher education and into business over the next four years. There's the Global Challenges Research Fund, about 1.5 billion was promised in 2016, and many of you, and certainly at our institution, we've been bidding for and applying for um, those res resources. Um, <coughs> we have also things like the Office uh, for Students and TEF, which replaced um, HEFKE. So the TEF applies in England, there's resource attached to it. Do we in Scotland then um, contribute to the TEF or do we not? There's no resource attached to it, no um, implication other than uh, a marketing accolade for a gold, silver, or bronze, although I'm told that um, it's likely that the whole idea of gold, silver, and bronze will, will disappear um, in due course. And that might be, due course might be very soon. Um, I mentioned Brexit, and one of the reasons I'm going to Madrid is um, the, the Vice Chancellor of uh, University of Liverpool, um, the Vice Chancellor of Cardiff, representing Wales, and me representing Scotland, are going round. And some say it's our farewell tour of Europe as we go round, <laughs> um, speaking to all our colleagues in the different countries and saying um, we really don't want to be leaving, but we're being forced into this situation, and we're having conversations with um, them about. How do we um, continue post-Brexit? How do we make sure that that ecosystem of research and education, of student mobility, um, is maintained in a post-Brexit situation and trying to make sure that um, the, good, um, the, the good relationships that we have are maintained and sustained and also understand their perspective so that UKI, who is, is organising the trip, um, for us can lobby into government to explain the importance of different aspects of, of Brexit in a higher education, higher education context. Um, personal anecdote from Stirling University and people say is it having, having a, an impact. I've received letters from staff who um, were from Germany and other parts of Europe who said I'm going back to Germany to live. Kind of had enough, not going to be here anymore and Brexit's the reason. So I mean I, that's just the ones that I receive, and I know there, there are others um, who are experiencing that. Because of the home and EU fee status of um, uh, students from the EU and Scotland, where they don't pay fees, they're treated the same as a, a, a Scottish home student, um, we have about um, roughly 10% of the student population here at undergraduate, postgraduate taught, and postgraduate research <coughs> level are from the EU. The equivalent in England is 5.5%. Um, and while the absolute numbers are, are, are uh, quite different, uh, the, the logic is that uh, because of the, uh, the uh, lack of fees here for EU students, that's why the numbers. So what we're expecting to happen in Scotland is that there will be a, a substantial reduction in the number of European students who will... Um, come here, and what's the impact then on, certain, on some universities and some courses? The reliance on those students coming because they ha they want to do particular courses um, is great, and that would, might mean that courses aren't able to continue because they don't have um, critical masses uh, going forward. So there are some serious implications um, for this, and there's also actually some uh, serious um, dosh attached to it. At the minute, it costs there's about 
1,024 million pounds of public money in Scotland goes to the 19 higher education institutions per annum. Um, about 95 million of that pays for the fees for uh, European students. When those students, uh, when, when we're no longer required to do that because of EU law, uh, the Scottish Government, well, un it's unlikely that they'll continue to, to fund uh, those students. And the question is, what happens to that £95 million? Pounds? Um, it's quite likely that, um, well, we're arguing it should stay in higher education and we're hoping that, um, that it does. Um, quite quickly going through the funding situations, and this is um, really around Scotland uh, specifically. I'll go through it really quite quickly. But... I've been um, principal and vice chancellor at Stirling now for about eight and a half years, and there hasn't been a real <coughs> terms increase in funding um, since I've been in post. We've been dealing constantly with um, a declining public resource. Um, and one of our strategic objectives actually within the strategic plan is to reduce our reliance on government funding and it's for an obvious reason we don't see it ever um, turning around and, 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 and imp improving, uh, improving too much. Audit Scotland looked at the sector in 2016 and said it was unsustainable if it progressed in the direction that it was and we're about now, roughly now about 10% per student underfunded in Scotland compared to England and if Philip Auger's review reduces the fees in England um, to six thousand odd pounds a year, that or six and a half thousand pounds a year. That'll be immediately impact on us because we have about a thousand in Stirling, for example, we've got about a, a thousand rest of UK students at the university paying their nine thousand pounds a year, and if that drops by thirty percent, there'll be a, a big impact uh, on us, and that has the knock-on effect into computer kit, all the stuff that we intend to do, and of course our, 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 overall, our overall strategy. Um, final slide from me before I pass over to, um, to David and, and Dash for the airport, but the, uh, the whole international picture is really important. As I say, our funding has been, um, uh, hasn't increased in real terms. Um, and what have we been doing? Well, uh, as uh, or like many other universities in the UK, we've been continuing to internationalise. We teach in Singapore, we teach in China, we have uh, quite a few t &E operations and we have many international students um, coming to the university. And while that's good in itself, and we have many students travelling outward from the university also, and it's really quality life experience. It's also helping to prop up the system to a large degree and um, part of our objective in continuing to grow the international student numbers is to actually help continue to pay for the quality of the education that we have um, have here in Scotland. Um, I touched and I'll just find and of course research collaboration being part of the European Research Council the big facilities that we have in Edinburgh, um, large-scale computing centres, we want to make sure that all of those are protected going forward. It all costs money. We need to be able to make sure that we have the resource um, to pay for that. And I'll just finally say one final point about, um, uh, her, uh, about uh, Brexit and the European Union. Horizon 2020 and Erasmus Plus are two things that we were given some assurances about, provided there's a, there is a deal. Um, so as things stand, if the, if the um, withdrawal agreement that's on the table stands, it's likely that those um, will be quasi-secure going forward. Um, if there's a no-deal situation, all of that, the staff mobility, the student movement, the Horizon 2020 or Horizon Europe, as I think it's going to be called, um, Erasmus, um, all of those things, all come back into play to an extent that they could all disappear, and I think we'd all be a lot poorer as as a consequence. So I'm going to I'm going to end there and pass over to David. I hope that um, some of that gloomy um, prognosis um, will also contextualise your um, you know the expectations around um, what's possible in a university, but also hopefully that um, you'll think in terms of at different levels within the organisation, not necessarily just at the institutional level, strategy and understanding strategy and agreeing it and getting buy into it is absolutely critically um, important. So thank you um, for your time and I'll pass over now to um, David.
Thanks, Jerry. Thank you very much, Jerry. Certainly a, a, an interesting uh, set of challenges for us going forward. Um, some of them a little bit threatening, I think, for us as institutions. Um, a quick observation from me. Um, I think we're well on our way to covering all the home nations on stage today. We've got Natalie, clearly Welsh. <laughs> <coughs> Sally's from Dundee. Trust me, that's a different country. <coughs> Irish, of course, and uh, the only true Scotsman in the room standing up here. Um, I'm going to try and do this as a bit of a conversation, so stick with me on this and uh, stick your hands up if you've got some comments or points you would like to make as I start to work through some of the thinking Jerry and I had before we got here. Um, but he set a funding context. It's going to be tough. We know it's going to be tough. Um, and yet we know we have to invest. It would probably help if I put my glasses on and then I can see. Um, however, we do need to invest and the investment required to do this is likely to be difficult in the current climate. Being able to invest in our systems and in our information and our data and emerging technologies is going to be quite a challenge. Um, I've been speaking to a new colleague of mine, David Lean, and he said, for a long time, efficiency savings have in effect pushed an issue from one area of an institution to another and are not actually efficiency. This requires a totally different approach to achieve actual savings. And I thought that interesting because I'm confident that I've got a room full of people here who understand that as soon as there's cutbacks in the university, they come to the IT people and say, you need to help us, you need to do more, and yet we're struggling to get funding. Anybody disagree with the fact we're struggling to get funding for our major projects? No, didn't think so. Um, I'm going to argue, therefore, that efficiency and effectiveness needs to be demonstrated by firstly sweating our existing assets. The questions are, are we using our systems effectively? Do we capture all the data we should? And finally, are we linking our data with sector and cross-sector data systems? I would suggest not sufficiently, and as such, big data challenges need to be addressed. So starting with our systems, I'm looking for somebody to say a few words on any transformational projects that are going on in their institutions at the moment. Anybody want to stick their hands up? Okay, Eileen, I'll come to you. Yeah, no, I'll come to Eileen now, sorry. Can I have the microphone to Eileen here? I knew you would be a bit slow, so I've picked on my new colleague, Eileen, to, oh, to say a few yeah. words. Thanks very much, David. David starts <laughs> on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, quite interesting actually. Um, I have prepared something, but I'm quite interested in the fact that what I have written down is eff efficiency and effectiveness. And I think at Stirling University, um, if all the transformation projects that we're doing just now are about our strategic plan and achieving our strategic plan objectives. Um, but it's a lot about creating efficiencies, removing manual effort, removing all those, connecting those systems together and looking at the integration as well. Um, and also using our systems more and getting our faculties and our professional services people on board with that. I mean, some of the things that we are doing uh, this year and also looking at the, the student experience and what that is to our, our applicants and our, our students as well. And that's, that's, a, that's a theme that runs through everything that, that we are working on. Um, research, as Jerry mentioned, it's, a, it's, it's, it's definitely one of our, our areas that we want to focus on as well. Um, and employability. <coughs> so there's a number of systems transformation projects we're doing that we were fortunate enough we did get investment for, so that's, that's which is good. Um, so we implemented a new research management system, um, bringing a lot of things that previously were in different systems together, so pre, post award, publication, so again sweating those assets. Um, a placement management system as well, again all in spreadsheets, bringing it all together, looking at our rotational placements, direct placements, um, and look at our whole applicant journey and revisiting all of that and then making uh, big improvements on that front. Uh, and just making it easier for the applicant, but as well as those end end processes um, and passing the information across the university. We have very centralised processes. Um, also moving from, I think, with efficiency and effectiveness, moving from in-house systems to a third-party vendor. Uh, 
it's nice, but it's a bit of a luxury having in-house developed systems, um, unless you can't get them elsewhere, um, because the burden goes on to the um, development teams and infrastructure teams. Um, and one thing, uh, one other thing to mention, uh, Jerry mentioned the um, the sports development. So we have a very large build sports development, and we'll be putting in a new sports management system as well as part of that. So just you know, really pushing the strategic agenda um, at Stirling. Thank you very much, Eileen. Sports management systems. <laughs> I have some experience of those, let me tell you. Okay, um, I need the microphone at James uh, from uh, James Smith from Leeds Burbank. Stuck his hands up. James, you're having some interesting issues with uh, moving to the cloud and business transformation systems that you're involved in. Yeah. Um when you phoned me the other week for us to arrange this spontaneous conversation, <laughs> I, started, uh, I started thinking about what to say. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I, I just sort of don't want to um, dwell on the misery, but um, let me just linger in the misery for a little bit longer. <laughs> I, I, I feel like we are um, we're existing in a time of um, rapidly, rapidly increasing complexity. So our first problem is that we are all managing a whole heap of complexity, even before you look at the other challenges that are coming. Um, and a, an interesting thought experiment that I, that I posed to some of my colleagues a couple of weeks ago was, if you were to go back 10 years and sever all the data cables going in and out of your data centers, how long would it be before everybody came banging on your door? And I I suggest to you that unless it was the week of clearing, you probably get you, lots, lots of parts of the organization would limp on for quite a while before everything ground to a halt. I suggest if you were to do that today, you would be in a whole heap of pain a lot faster. Um, and I, I say that because so much more of our organizations are reliant, heavily reliant, totally reliant now on most of the systems we're providing um, in a way that they weren't. I mean. Uh, uh, you know, it won't surprise any of you that I'm incredibly young. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, no, it, um, in all seriousness, it's only 15 years since I graduated. When I graduated, I went. I was. I, I spent my entire undergraduate uh, time uh, in an organisation that had no data projectors in any classrooms. Nobody would have noticed if the institutional connectivity had disappeared during the teaching day. Everybody used overhead projectors. We didn't have a Moodle instance. There was no Wi-Fi across the campus. Um, that has totally changed, fundamentally. So we are dealing with, and, and it changed rapidly, and it changed in lots of organizations in a, in a relatively unplanned way. And we have heaped systems on top of each other and ended up with great big piles of legacy technology that we are having to manage. On top of which, as Jerry's outlined, as you've outlined, there are large financial pressures and student experience pressures to do more. Um, and unfortunately, our, our staff are being very demanding to us to do more with the, um, uh, with the apparent technology that exists there. And they're using consumer electronics and consumer technologies, um, which look slick and behave slickly. Um, and they want that. But we're trying to firefight the misery that we've got from the last however many years. Um, and they don't understand why they can't just go out and buy something. Um, and unfortunately, some of our vendor friends, there's probably some in the room and I won't be too unpleasant to them, but some of our vendor friends are very eager to say, yes, yes, we can do that. But they don't necessarily provide the sorts of integration capabilities that we want to enable us to implement new systems going forwards that don't carry with them all of the technical, technical debt burdens that the old systems that we're still fighting with have from the past. So um, I haven't got an answer for you, David, but uh, <laughs> that, that, that's, that's our set of challenges, I propose. Thank you. Thank you. That's, uh, that's all my powers exhausted, by the way. So, so, <laughs> <coughs> so please pitch in a little bit later on. OK. Um, My pal, who's not here, um, Ian Anderson, uh, led a community of practice on enterprise architecture. And uh, I've put his, the quote that the, the team came up with, which I thought was really helpful. 
because there's a myriad of quotes out there around enterprise architecture, but they defined it as enterprise ar architecture is the creation of strategy for process and IT change, reflecting the integration and standardization requirements for a university's operating model. The, the operating model is the desired state of process integration and process standardization for delivering a university's core activities, education and research, as well as planning and administration. Um, the key words for me here are the desired state. And I would, I would contend that we've not achieved in our universities the desired state. And if we've got new strategies emerging, then the desired state is something in the future, and that's what we've got to work towards. <clears throat> in order to deliver a university strategy, we need to understand our current state and then develop our desired state to support the change that evolved organization. So in short, Enterprise architecture is a mechanism that translates the change required in IT and the business processes to support business change, making it relevant to our senior teams, quantifiable, and importantly, demonstrably focused on delivering the strategy. EA is a way to help you communicate with your senior teams to get money and deliver their strategy. It's easy to implement enterprise architecture, isn't it? Anybody want to comment on that? Oh, James has got a microphone. Thank you, James. Oh, can you? Yes, you can. Um, plant free. <laughs> um, <laughs> two hours, four hour, uh, Two days, four hours before he's not my boss anymore, <laughs> and he's still asking me to do things. <laughs> um, enterprise architecture. We've been looking at it for a number of years, and again, defining it has been quite difficult. What, what's been the good things we've done? We've put an enterprise service bus, allowed our data to be managed across the services fairly easily. We are centralised as well, so it, it's, it's quite good in that way. Over the last couple of years with the cloud services, we've got then that web service API that's on top of that, so it allows external services to interact with the internal services. So you're getting that kind of hybrid model as well, and that, that's going on. Um, what does that bring in when things go wrong because you're putting it through centralized? So we've got processes in place or big buttons, our big red button to switch off when it is going wrong uh, as well. So that, that's kind of there. Um, it never really got to the, the utopia of, of EA um, uh, mapping all the systems and actually what we've got is the tools there to do that but the time and effort to do that put all the systems in when you switch off a field or, and you know how that impacts across the systems. <laughs> I think we're getting there but that's, that's, that, that's different. But you go, we'll, we'll probably never get there now obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I say that. Yeah. Um, it, the capability I think is probably something else there as well that, that something that I think we're probably better in IT and across the enterprise because we talk about enterprise. Um, we need to define um, the capabilities much better. We need to understand that, define it, make sure we're doing the right things and then eventually link it to the systems rather than I think the other ways that we used to do it as well. So I think that's probably some good and bad bits about it. Thanks, James. Um, for those of you that don't know, the capability models on the USISA website is really worth looking at. The blog's really interesting. And, uh, and there's quite a lot of information there to support it. Um, uh, the, the view still is you've got to understand your organization in order to be able to help it. OK, so we've got to a point where we're thinking that um, Eileen's implemented all these systems and they're fabulous. Um, uh, James has got an EA model established and we understand how it's all working. So in effect, we've got a solid foundation for change. Um, but clearly, this is not the end of the story. It, it simply supports us operating effectively currently and to be able to demonstrate and describe its impacts. <clears throat> but it's now necessary to use this platform of effective systems and a well-described EA operating model to plan the changes that will support the strategy. At the heart of this will be analytics. Data analytics, just for today, I'm going to describe as the use of data to inform and drive business decision making. Having improved our systems and our processes and described our operating model, it is data that will confirm whether we're efficient or not. Um, the use of accurate data from across our systems to provide information on our performance in turn delivers knowledge on where and what we need to improve or change to grow our business. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick on somebody else just because I can at the moment. I know Patrick Bellis is in... Oh, Patrick, right at the front, I should have spotted you. Um, 
Could you tell us a wee bit about what JISC are doing to support us in data analytics? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, although I'll start by just reflecting on a couple of the kind of previous slides and previous comments. I think in terms of efficiency and effectiveness, uh, one of the things we can do when we're squeezed is, is that more collaborative working and working across the sector. Um, uh, and, you know, going back to the welcoming comments about the importance of networking events such as this and the power of that and what that can bring. Um, so JISC over time has uh, collaborated with uh, many different organisations, including all, all its member institutions as well. Um, the EA um, community of practice actually came out of former JISC project uh, stuff originally. But we did the good work. <laughs> <laughs> we, we started. Collaborative. But, um, uh, <laughs> but um, certainly now, I mean, the, the data analytics field is uh, is obviously big, um, a big target area for JISC and others. Um, we're doing some uh, two collaborative ventures with HESA in terms of uh, services that are either uh, on stream or about to come on stream. Um, hopefully, uh, many of you are on the USISA announce list and may have seen in this morning's um, uh, weekly roundup, the, uh, um, th there was a push in there for one of those services, which is the analytics lab stuff, which is, again is a push to work jointly across institutions to look at um, common um, areas of uh, um, interest in terms of business intelligence and analytics. Um, and uh, tackling those problems uh, across the piece. Um, and, th and that's like a really good CPD opportunity for, for JISC, USISA and, uh, and HESA members to, uh, to engage in that. The outcomes of that stuff will actually be coming through next year as a new service in terms of collaborative, I'm sorry, community dashboards that will, will um, be available through uh, HESA's Heidi Plus service. Um, and then the third uh, um, uh, array of services that JISC have uh, recently um, started to roll out is learning analytics itself in terms of a, um, a predictive uh, solution. Initially, the rollout is looking at um, predicting uh, successful course completion based on um, progression data from VLEs, but, but over time is uh, scoped to look at adding in uh, other engagement attributes like library and attendance uh, stuff as well. So, so all of that's all, all big stuff just on the verge or coming soon. Excellent. Thank you, Patrick. Um, I'm going to return briefly to uh, David Lean's earlier posit. Um, being an efficient and effective university will be cr critical to future success. No, nobody can really argue that one, I would suggest. Digital efficiency, though, should not be considered solely about saving money. It's got to be about grasping the opportunities. Um, using digital technologies to provide common platforms that are interactive and smart enhance the experience of all who engage or work within universities. Using digital technologies to significantly improve self-service while delivering a personalised feel for the user can bring efficiency to even the mundane of processes. It's in these areas where we're already seeing artificial intelligence grow to support transactions and bring machine learning to improve processes and has the potential to deliver that personalised feel and that community feel that we're all looking for. Um, the future of AI is now unfolding. It's unlocking benefits. Um, what AI can bring to an institution has got to be dependent on its, the institution's readiness to adopt it. It's got to be skills and culture uh, that's open to taking on the new challenges of AI. But I'm going to come back to digital skills a little bit later. Um, if AI, I would suggest, if implemented carefully and for business improvement, we, we can ref revolutionise many of the service tasks that we do. Um, however, my reason for bringing AI to the table at this point is because one huge area for AI to make an impact will be understanding and harnessing the power of big data. Making data smarter will require AI to analyse and corral that data within our institutions and beyond. Um, due to the activities you've heard about already, there won't be many institutions at this time that are not considering their data architecture and how it needs to transform, not, not least of all because of HESA's ambitious data future plans, hopefully. <coughs> um, and we have already discussed the need for our systems and our processes and our operating models to evolve through enterprise architecture. We must, though, recognise that structured data, and that data is well defined and stored in organisational units, and we can all understand it, is only one part of the story. Each day, institutions and social media gather masses of data, 
and little of it's being used for the benefit of our students and our institutions. <clears throat> so predicting student performance using learning analytics and delivering interventions when and where students most need it will not only require advanced analytics, but AI engines with the ability to detect complex patterns in the most disparate of data. There are already institutions using AI. Quick show of hands. Anybody trialing any AI or using AI at the moment? A couple here. Going well? Yep. Would you mind telling us what you're doing? Could we get... <laughs> See, you stuck your hand up. <laughs> Tell us who you are and where you're from first, please. Uh, from Lancaster University and working with Amazon um, to uh, allow uh, students to um, discover information uh, about their student journey through voice. Excellent. So, it's already here. Um, I know that we are dabbling in it. James is very fond of Alexa, and we've got a few stories about that in the bar later, but... Uh, <laughs> but I'd like to pick up on the learning analy analytics theme. Anybody piloting it, pushing that forward at the moment? Mike. Thank you, David. Mike Wyman, University of Aberdeen. Uh, we're in the process of undertaking uh, a proof of concept, I guess, at the moment, uh, focusing around the creation of a learning analytics policy um, using Stream to allow the university to use our data and analyze it and really understand if there's sufficient quality within that data to make use of learning analytics. And um, what's been interesting, we've been doing it for a few months now, I would say a sort of pilot concept. Um, what we've recognized is we've currently got no consistent process or system to collate and analyze that data for the purposes of the analytics, for learning analytics. And the introduction of the system will hopefully allow us to use the data that we're currently holding and actually gain intelligence from it around both uh, student engagement, feedback, but ultimately making them more successful students. Um, that's both for the staff and the students. So the data that we're capturing, hopefully if we get the right policies in place, we select the right systems, it will then allow the student to see what they can do to be a better student, to be more successful, to get the grades they want. But hopefully we'll also allow our staff to engage at the level of intervention, if appropriate, earlier co access to relevant content. They can see the areas of weakness and strength. Um, so we've said we, we've engaged with Stream, we've, we've done a, that, that proof of concepts ongoing. Um, we've taken the data, uh, we've had the report back, we're validating it with our academics and what's been really interesting to see is how well that AI has actually performed. So of all the data we've captured so far, of all those levers in our sample set, 94% of those who actually left gave us at least four weeks worth of notice based on the algorithms within the learning analytics profile. And 50% of those who left gave us six months worth of notice. Oh my word. <laughs> and when we put into that context of six months worth of ability to engage with those individuals who ultimately left our institution, I think that, that value just speaks for itself in terms of that hidden data that we've got sitting out there. Thanks, Mike. That's really, really helpful. Um, and, and I hope just strengthens that point around learning to use our data to tell us things, to help us, to make decisions, to inform the business. Um, but ultimately, if we are supporting our students better because we understand their issues and we can intervene earlier, then clearly we're, we're going to hit that widening participation issue that our Scottish government is so interested in. Um, I'm saying here that doing more with less is rooted in enabling, enabling technologies. Uh, they provide new platforms, systems and services that impact positively across the university. We've already seen the cultural impact of Skype for Business and messaging apps such as WhatsApp changing the landscape of how we collaborate, communicate and share. It is though important to embrace new and emerging technologies um, within research, teaching and learning at a more fundamental level. Um, I'm going to use that dreaded word, agility. Um, but we need agility in this context because actually some of the things that we're working with now are actually not going to be here in five years' time. And so we've got to be able to change as the technology changes. A lot of these con consumer technologies that we are using 
are going to change and they're going to be different. And we need to be prepared for that. Um, I've mentioned the use of na- enabling technologies, but WhatsApp, the rise of chatbots, AI, and learning beyond borders. <laughs> I have no idea what that means. <laughs> I didn't do all of these slides, as you might have uh, worked out. Um, but I thought it very interesting. It, it should be no surprise that the social media companies are now eyeing the corporate environment. Um, workplace Facebook, affection, affectionately known at Edinburgh Napier as to Facebook. <laughs> I can say that now I've left. It's bringing its basic function, functionality to staff engagement. But, but there are serious implications here. I see huge opportunities in the innovation that social media has driven. And I would liken it to, to you know, a few years back when we had Bring Your Own Device. We need to embrace new ways of collaborating and engage with the notion that some of that collaboration will be with robots. <laughs> Might be called Alexa but there are several others hitting the market now. It will not necessarily be technology that disrupts how we learn, teach and do research, but success will come from a well-integrated suite of technologies working in harmony with the user. You might see some of this is still quite far off, but I think AI is going to come at us extremely quickly. Um, And one thing we did learn from the BOIOD revolution was that we've got to embrace that opportunity. <clears throat> it does come with significant risk. So it's therefore incumbent on IT and IT leadership to grasp these opportunities and importantly secure their use to ensure that we provide safe and accessible opportunities for our communities and stakeholders. Workplace Facebook may work in some institutions with a small group of staff engaged with it, even though we know that Facebook has some real security issues. Nevertheless, people are going to want to use it. Because the question is, why use something that may put us at risk longer term? The answer comes back to the same. It's because our users understand it. And actually, it's why Microsoft have had such a stranglehold in the market for such a long place, because it's part of our cognitive learning. And once once it's in your system, once your people are using it, they'll want to continue using it because they understand it and they want to work with it. Um, These technologies will also, as I've already mentioned, help the widening participation agenda. There's some brilliant work going on for BSL users, um, and we're seeing just-in-time information uh, driven by AI. Um, But we should really consider this a burning platform um, that acknowledges that radical change is needed in our transactional services. Accepting our business systems and processes are often costly, and many of them have grown organically, sometimes built within our own institutions. Um, we've got to consider radically changing our approach and re-engineer both processes and systems to align them with the needs of our university and their stakeholders. And we need to step away from that fear of change and help our users step away from that fear. And we've got to ensure that we carry our people with us. Um, Because if we don't, then we're going to experience quite a significant gap between our technological capability and, their, and the skills of our staff and their ability to exploit them. Um, I'm going to briefly move on to uh, smart campuses. Um, evolving our campuses into those which are smart and technology enabled has the potential to go beyond the revolution that is occurring in our homes. The future will redefine the boundaries of our physical campuses, bringing them closer to our students and our stakeholders. Our learning spaces are already integrating into our social spaces blurring those lines between formal classrooms, learning spaces, and social learning spaces. The next step will see full integration of our virtual environments where our learning materials are not only accessible, but usable wherever you are on campus or even if you're not on campus, and supporting students and researchers' engagement with academics and collaborators. Key to this will be those of you who can envisage a campus as merely one hub and a collection of campuses and virtual environments that are interchangeable to deliver an excellent staff and student experience wherever they are. Our campuses are already beginning to identify users and visitors and to deliver to their smartphones location information, timetable information, and the future will target information and resources to those on and off campus, that martini thing again, wherever and whenever they need it. 
However, as indicated earlier, the linking of our campuses with our virtual environments will build communities locally and internationally to deliver a personalised and supported experience wherever you are working and collaborating. Link this with real-time analytics and AI enhanced data and the future is truly exciting for researchers, students and staff. It's not always working. Okay. Um, if we're talking about AI, we can't go past the emergence of VR and augmented reality. Um, Edinburgh Napier have got a couple of serious projects uh, in the medical areas. Um, full immersion that safely guides students or re researchers through challenging man medical scenarios or assists in navigating complex data is already being used here. Um, I thought that astonishing. It's actually increased since I, since I first picked up that, that number. It's going to be worth $182 billion as an industry. <coughs> Clearly, VR and AR social networks evolve. They might seriously change the way that we collaborate and work together. So we need to be thinking about this. We're painting a picture here of AI, VR, chatbots, social media integration, smart campuses. So the future's bright, right? Well, maybe. Okay, I mentioned this a bit earlier. I'm going to close with what for me is a sobering thought. I've been speaking on this subject and about how many institutions have made considerable strides forward in implementing new technologies for teaching, learning and research. We're seeing our learning spaces transform, our virtual ex environments expand beyond recognition, we're integrating AI-driven knowledge bases. We've got video conferencing, plagiarism detection, online assessment, digital submission, and AI-driven support. But I have spoken about institutions' technological ability by 2020 being far in advance of its staff and students' capability to exploit it. And herein lies a significant danger. Because it's not only critical to use the technology to aid learning, but it needs to be taught within the curriculum in order to prepare our students for future workplaces with advanced technology supporting or assisting with their activities. The true threat of disruption, I'm not sure we know what that is yet. There's lots of disruption going on, political, some self-induced through Brexit, etc. But digital presents the UK education sector with a real opportunity to compete locally and internationally. There's considerable concern and it's been expressed by USISA and JISC, because we do work collaboratively. And we're predicting that this skills gap will inhibit universities fully exploiting current and emerging technologies. And further, will impact curriculum development that should be introducing students to how digital can enhance their experience and their opportunities for success in their futures. It's therefore really important for universities to recognise in their digital strategies that it all begins with culture and skills not technology. Developing skills in digital and exploiting fully the available technologies in research and our teaching and learning prepares universities for future disruption. If we can today accept that together, that predicting the form of any future disruption is almost impossible, it's my assertion that being digitally enabled as an institution and being part of a workforce with cutting edge digital skills, we're more likely to be able to survive and indeed flourish as disruption emerges. And I'm going to return to Professor McCormack's description, my boss, <laughs> of the political and operating landscape over the next few years. It will support our need to be effective locally and internationally in delivering our university offering. A digitally fluent workforce is prepared for disruption. It is agile. It is prepared to compete on an international footing with those reaching beyond their borders and are using technology to do so. We all have a role in promoting digital skills capability and being the source of knowledge and guidance for our universities. It's your leadership that can and will make the difference. So we're very conscious of time. We're getting near coffee time. So thanks for listening to me. And thanks to Jerry for his opening uh, 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 few words and uh, setting that scene for us. Uh, before I go, any questions? Anybody want to make a statement about what was being discussed this morning so far or this afternoon? I've beaten you all into submission. All right, I think we'll break for coffee. Thanks very much.